in lesson 16a we're going to be um, talking about describing rates and actually most of um, unit 16 we're going to be talking about linear relationships we're going to take situations that you can uh, model with a linear equation and we're going to talk about those uh, and a linear equation is just when you if you were to graph a linear equation it would graph as a line that's where the word the linear equation linear comes from and um, that just means that it goes up at a consistent rate um, and so what we're going to talk about first in this unit is we're going to talk about um, gas mileage with some different vehicles and typically we'll say how much a vehicle um, gets like how much it gets per gallon how many miles it gets per gallon and if we think of that as a consistent thing then we can um, figure out how far the car will go per an amount of gas. So if you know that you have five miles or five gallons of gas, you can figure out how many miles you're going to go for that. So um, let's look at the scenario that they have here for us. And it says we're going to be looking at interpreting numbers in advertising or product descri descriptions because sometimes it can be problematic because they don't always give them in the same term so it's hard to compare things. Data can be presented in ways that point to fa faulty conclusions sometimes and the table below presents the approximate distances that three ve uh, vehicles can travel on a tank of gas. So first we have a Suburban and it says the Suburban on a tank of gas um, can go 651 miles. That a Focus, a Ford Focus, can go 446.4 miles on a tank of gas on average and that a volt can go 380 miles um, on a tank of gas. So it says write down one conclusion or impression that you can draw from the t data above. So when you look at this, this seems to tell you that um, the Suburban can go the greatest distance and the volt can go the shortest distance. So uh, the Suburban, oops, let me get the pen a little thicker than that. Um, can go the furthest and the volt can go the shortest distance. Now that would make you possibly believe that the Suburban gets the best ga gas mileage and the Volt gets the um, lesser gas mileage. However, we know that's probably not true. If you're familiar with vehicles at all, Suburban is a, is a fairly large SUV and a Volt is a little compact car. So is it truly a possibility that the Suburban gets better miles per gallon than the Volt does? Probably not. So why does it look like in this table that there's something better about the miles that the Suburban gets than that the Volt gets. Why does the gas mileage appear to be better here than it does here? Well, hopefully one of the things that you're thinking to yourself is this says miles per tank, not miles per gallon. Okay, so this does not say miles per gallon. And so what we're doing here is we're kind of comparing apples to oranges because just because the Suburban can go the furthest on a tank doesn't mean it gets the best gas mileage. A Suburban is likely to have a much larger gas tank than a Volt. So two questions we would really like to have answered so that we can kind of interpret this is um, how many gallons does each vehicle hold in a full tank? So what is a full tank? Um, and if we're talking about, you know, any other questions that you'd like to have answered, you might come up with some different things, but um, we'd probably like to know how many miles per gallon each vehicle gets. We can find out that information. 
So how many miles per gallon will the volt go? How many miles per gallon will the focus go? And how many miles per gallon will the suburban go? So our next question says a suburban has a fuel capacity of 31 gallons. So that's a pretty big gas tank for a, just a passenger vehicle. How can you use this new information to find out how, how far a suburban can travel on one tank of gas? So knowing that it has a fuel capacity of 31 gallons and it can go 651 miles on that, we can figure out how many miles per gallon it gets. Um, we know it gets 651.0 miles on 31 gallons. Well, our question then is how many miles per one gallon. And we've done problems like this before. If you're just trying to get down to one, we just need to take the top number and divide it by the bottom number. So if we take 651, 651.0 technically, and divide that by 31, we get 21 miles for one gallon of gas for the Suburban. So in three, it just says, how can you use this new information? And we're going to use it by dividing and reducing it down to a, a simpler ratio. And then it says to calculate. So we've done both of these things. Now write a contextual sentence interpreting the me uh, meaning of the number you found. So what is 21 miles per gallon? You know, usually it's written, when you go to look at a vehicle, it's written like this, 21 mpg. So what does that mean? Well, that means, on average, and remember this is not going to be perfect, but on average, the Suburban will travel 21 miles on each t uh, gallon of gas. So, Theoretically, if you had one gallon of gas, you should be able to drive 21 miles on that. If you had two mile, gallons of gas, you should be able to drive 42 miles on that. So every gallon of gas that you have in that vehicle will take you 21 miles. So now let's um, go up here to our table. It says create a table like the one shown and use your answer to question four to calculate the distance. So we don't have to create the table. It's already there. I don't know why they say create it. Um, it's already here. So obviously if we had zero gallons of gas, I'm going to kind of add that in here. If we had zero gallons of gas, we could go zero miles. We just said if you have one gallon of gas, you could go 21 miles. That's what 21 miles per gallon means. So one gallon would get you 21 miles. So two gallons should get you 42 miles. And every gallon after that just adds on 21 more miles that you can go. So this would be 63, 84, 105, 126, and 147. So between each of these, I'm just adding 21 to the total. So, according to this, if we had seven gallons of gas left in the tank of that Suburban, we should be able to drive 147 miles. Now it says that we're supposed to use that to um, plot the coordinate points on this, on this graph. So, we're going to take what we have here in the table and we're going to try to graph it here. So, um, I can't get both of these on the screen at the same time, but we know this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and here's our, our bottom numbers. So for this one was for 0 gallons. So for 0 gallons, we're going to go 0 miles per hour, or 0 miles. 1 gallon is 21. So we're going to come over to the 1 here, and we're going to go up to 21. When you fill in um, a graph like this, it's really important that you know what the scale is. So right here is 50, and there's four marks in here. So this must be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. But they wouldn't have had to mark it by 10s. They could have marked it by um, 25. They could have 
Um, and so it could be could have been a mark in the middle right at 25. They don't actually have a mark right in the middle because that would be between the 20 and the 30. So we just have to be real careful where we put the numbers here and pay attention to this scale. So 21 would be just slightly above 20. Two miles, or two gallons rather, would take us 41 miles, 42 miles. So here's 40, and we're just a little bit above 42. Uh, three gallons would take us 63 miles, so, so there's 50, 60, 70, so it'd be a little bit below half. Uh, 84 for four miles, so here's 80, 90, and 100, so 84 would be pretty close to halfway, but not quite. And then 105. Here's 100, here's 110, it should be right in the center of those. 6 would be 126, 10, 20, 30, so it would be right about here. And then lastly, we were at 7 gallons, and that should take us 147 miles. So that's just a little bit short of 150. And you'll notice, as I mentioned before, that this graph says a line. Um, if I was doing this uh, somewhere else besides on this tablet, I would get out some sort of a straight edge to draw this. What I would recommend you do, it works really well if you're doing it by hand, is use like a little card like your student ID or a credit card or something. Um, works really well for a straight edge. It doesn't have to be a ruler. So I'm going to do my best to go through these with a line. It's kind of hard with this media, but best I can here. So this should develop in a straight line. It wasn't too bad. So as we continue, you, we could have more gallons, and which would give us a uh, further distance. And so I put an arrow on the end just to say, hey, this can keep going. And I'm going to put a title at the top of this. So this is miles Um, driven for suburban. So lastly, it asks us to write a few sentences in our own words describing how the behavior of your graph relates to the information in the problem. So the behavior of our graph is that it graphs in a line, and the reason it graphs in a line is because it goes up at a consistent rate. So we're rising the same amount each time. So we go up 21 gallons each time. I'm sorry, 21 miles each time we add a gallon. So if we add a gallon of gas, we go up 21 miles. Add another gallon of gas, we go up 21 miles. And because we're going up at that consistent rate, then we end up with a line. And that consistent rate in an, in, uh, an algebra class, and we're going to talk about it here in just a little bit, is called the slope. It's how fast it goes up, what the slope of the line is. So it slopes 21 miles for every additional gallon. So this goes up 21 miles for an additional gallon, up 21 miles for an additional gallon. So we would say the slope of this line is 21. So we're going to continue our discussion about the suburban and the focus and the volt. And uh, it says in part A, we were given some additional information. You were able to convert what you knew about miles per tank into miles per gallon for the suburban. And we created that graph. So I'm going to write that off to the side so we don't lose that information. This was um, the suburban got 31, well, not 31, I'll try that again, got 21 miles per gallon. So it says, what do you think the graph of gas distance would look like for the focus and the volt? Remember that the independent variables uh, are on the horizontal axis and the dependent variables are on the vertical axis. The horizontal axis is the gallons and the vertical axis are the miles. So what do you think would happen for the, uh, the focus and the volt? And the answer is that the focus would get likely more gallons per gas I'm sorry, more gallon, ugh, sorry, more miles per gallon than the suburban. 
And so its line would probably rise more quickly than this one because it's going to go up more for each gallon that you add. And then the volt even more than that. So I suspect that the focus and the volt will have steeper lines than the Suburban because we gain more miles for each gallon. So what information do you need so that we can check our prediction? Well, we need to know their, the focus and the volt miles per gallon. Or we need to know how many gallons in a tank. Because if they give us the ga gallons in the tank, we could figure out the miles per gallon for ourselves. So they either have to give us how many gallons it can go on a tank, or they have to tell us the miles per gallon straight up. And they're going to be nice enough that they're actually going to give us the... Um, oh, I take that back. They only give us the, the gallons of the tank, so we do have to calculate this ourselves. So I'm going to write this down. I'm going to kind of color code it. So for the Suburban, we had um, 21 miles per gallon. Um, I'm going to actually go back and rewrite that with blue, and I'm going to just kind of do everything with the Suburban in blue. So the Suburban was 21 miles per gallon. All right, so now for the focus, I'll do that in green. So for the focus, it says we have 12.4 gallons, and we can go 446 miles on that 12.4 gallons. So we can go 446.4 miles on 12.4 gallons of gas, because that's a full tank, and this is how far it can go on a tank. So if we take the top number and we divide it by the bottom number, that's how you do if you want to have the bottom number be 1, 446.4 divided by 12.4. And that comes out to be 36 miles per gallon. So on average, the Ford Focus is getting 36 miles per gallon. Um, so let me use something bright. I'll use orange here for the volt. And for the volt, it says it gets 9.3, or has 9.3 gallons in its tank. So if it can go 380 miles, it, the reason I know that goes on the top is, remember, my ultimate goal is miles per gallon. So whatever I want to have first is going to go on top, miles per gallon. So I have 380.0 miles on 9.3 gallons. So we suspected that this vehicle was going to have the best gas mileage. So let's see how that comes out. 380.0 divided by 9.3 comes out to be not quite 41. It's like 40.9. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just call it 41. So it's not quite 41 miles per gallon. That's 380 divided by 9.3. Now it says create tables for the focus and the volt like we did in lesson 16. So, and then we're supposed to plot those values on the same coordinate plane. So I'll put the coordinate plane back up here in a minute. But let's make our tables first. So for the focus, we could have a table like this, and we would have our uh, gallons and how many miles we could go. This is for the focus. And I always like to start with zero. So zero gallons of gas is going to get us zero miles. One gallon of gas is going to get us 36 miles. That's what 36 miles per, gallons, per gallon means. So two gallons, we should get twice as far, which is 72. Three, mi or three gallons, add another 36 on there, and we're at 108. For four gallons, add another 36 to that, 
So 108 plus 36, and we get 144. And if we add 36 to that again, 144 plus 36 is 180. We only need to get to 7 because we're trying to do it like we did with the uh, with the Suburban, and it only went up to 7. So 180 plus 36 gets us to one or to 216. And then 7 gallons of gas for that vehicle would get us 252 miles. So we're going to use this when we fill in the table here in a little bit. So the focus would go 252 miles on just seven gallons of gas. So let's use our orange here for the for the volt and let the top again be gallons, let the bottom be miles. And I think this will work out just fine. Zero gallons will get us zero miles. One gallon for this vehicle would get us 41 miles. Two gallons would get twice as much or another 41, which would bring us to 82 miles. Uh, after that, we've got 123 for three gallons. I'm just adding 41 each time, then I'm going to be at 164 for 4 gallons, and one, or uh, rather 205 for 5 gallons, and two forty six for 6 gallons, and 287 for 7 gallons. Okay, so as you can see, you can go slightly further on 7 gallons of gas with the Volt than you can for the Focus because it gets 5 miles per gallon better. So you can go, uh, at 7 miles, you can go 35 miles further for this one since it gets 5 miles per gallon more. So now, give me. A, uh, I'm going to put the um, the graph up here from last time, and uh, we'll put the focus and the volt on the same graph. And so this was the graph that we had from the last uh, unit, where we plotted 21 miles per gallon for the suburban, over a gallon and up 21 each time. So up 21 gallons, over, up 21 miles over one gallon, up 21 miles over a gallon. Now we're going to do the same thing here with the focus but we're going to do it with its rate of 36 miles per gallon. So we're going to still start at 0, 0. doesn't matter which vehicle you have. If you have no gas, you're not going anywhere. 1 would be 36 miles per gallon. 2 would be 72. Uh, 3 is 108. So 3 gallons gets us 108 miles per gallon. Uh, 4 gets us 144. 5 gets us 180. 6 gets us 216. So here's 200 to 10. That would be 220, so it's a little bit below that. Um, and then 7 gets us 252. I'm going to try to connect these with a fairly straight line. And that again could continue if you had more gallons of gas. So this is the focus. Whoops, I missed. Didn't get quite to the end there. Let me try that again. So this should go up to that last dot. then have the arrow on the end. 
And so this was for the Focus, and it had 36 miles per gallon. And then lastly, we'll plot the Volt, which will have an even steeper slope since it gets 41 miles per gallon. Still going to start at zero, doesn't matter what vehicle you have, not going anywhere on zero gallons of gas. There's 41, 2 is 50, 60, 70, 80, 2 miles, 3 is 123, there's 120, and 3, 4 is 164, 150, 160, Four, should be just slightly under half. Um, five is 205. So here's two, 200 and 210, so it would be right in the middle of those. Uh, six would give us 246. And seven would give us 287. So here's 280 and 290, so it would be right about there. So it's not as dramatic as from the Suburban to the Focus, because remember this went from 21 miles per gallon to 36, so that's a 15 mile per gallon increase. Here we're only increasing the gas mileage by 5 miles per gallon, but it's still going to be steeper than the Focus is. And this was for the Volt at 41 miles per gallon. So our kind of follow-up questions here ask us, how do the three slopes you found in the graph you created allow you to compare the fuel cost of operating the three cars in a meaningful way? So when we're looking at these, a steeper slope, like the orange and the green lines, so the steeper the slope, the better the miles per gallon. You could also think of it in a little bit more concrete way if you look at how far each one can go on seven gallons of gas. Well, the Suburban can only go, um, oh gosh, what was it, 100 20, 147. Not sure if I have that at the right location. No, it looks like it's okay. I got a little off on my lines here. But if you come over 150, the Suburban got 147 miles on those seven gallons, whereas the Focus got 252 miles and the Volt got uh, 287 miles. So this is a more sloped line, which means it's going to get more miles per gallon, or I'm sorry, more miles on that seven gallons of gas. And it's just going to continue. So give a reason why someone might buy each use, each of the cars based on the information in these lessons. Well, we don't have all the information about these cars. All we can do is kind of hypothesize from what we already know. And we know that one of the benefits of the Suburban is it can go further um, on a tank of gas. So say you want to fill up and you need to drive somewhere and you know there's not going to be a lot of gas stations. Uh, maybe you're out in the, the western part of Texas or you're in Wyoming or somewhere where it's not highly populated and you may have to go a while before you go get a, a tank of gas. Or say you live outside of a city and in order to get gas you have to go into the city. And you want to be able to drive around your property. Uh, Suburban puts in mind to me a rancher. Um, and so maybe as you're out doing work around your property you don't want to have to go into town to get gas any more often. Well the Suburban does get the most miles per tank. It's not the best miles per gallon, but it is the best miles per tank. You can go the furthest on one fill-up. Also, the Suburban out of these has the biggest um, space inside of it. It carries more people. It carries more things. Um, the, uh, the Focus, with its 36 miles per gallon, it's kind of an in-between. 
it's going to carry more passengers than the Volt. A Volt is smaller than a Focus. Um, it's still going to get a decent miles per gal or miles per tank and a decent miles per gallon, but it's going to have some more space inside. And then, of course, the the benefit of the Volt is that it gets the absolute best gas mileage. So if you're only carrying um, one or two people and you don't need to care to haul things or anything like that, like you might with the Suburban, the the Volt does get the best miles per gallon. So if you drive a lot. That's going to save you the most money in gas. So we're going to continue the discussion um, not with the miles per gallon of the car anymore, but we are continuing to talk about uh, modeling a linear situation. Um, and we're with the miles per gallon, um, that was a specific type of linear equation because with zero miles, you had zero gallons of or flip that. With zero gallons of gas, you could go zero miles. Not all linear situations start at zero, zero, though. And here we're talking about a family that's thinking about changing cell phone carriers and getting some additional phones. And after some research, they found a plan that includes uh, talk text, a thousand minutes of, of uh, that can be shared, it includes talk text and a thousand minutes that can be shared among the users of all phones. So I'm assuming they mean a thousand minutes of, of talking. No, that talk text. I don't even know what that means. This is kind of an old plan. A lot of the plans now are just all inclusive. Um, so I guess this means a thousand minutes of talking that can be shared among all the phones. Uh, so if we look at the first two data points in the table, what do they tell you about the slope of the relationship between the number of phones? So if you look from two phones to three phones, what we're trying to look at here is how much did we go up from two phones to three phones? So from two phones to three phones, we added $10. So the first two data points in the table tell us that each additional phone that you add on is going to be ten dollars. So each additional phone adds ten dollars to the cost. Now it says refer to the second and third data points from the table. How much more will it cost to have six phones rather than three. Well, from three phones to six phones, we added on an additional $30, which fits exactly what we said because we went up by, here we went up by one phone and we added $10. Here we went up by three phones and we added $30. Each, either way you look at that, that's $10 per additional phone. So this is $30 more for three phones. But that still comes out to be, if you divide that, that's still $10 per phone, per each additional phone. So how does your response to question two compare to one? Just like we said, it's, it's adding three phones, but it's the same rate. It's still $10 per phone. So now, how are we going to find the slope? It says if you were using the first and third data points, you could describe how to figure that out. So say they didn't give us this middle one. Say you only had this one and this one. Well, to get from the first to the third data points, that would be four additional phones. And it would be... You could tell from 2 to 6, if you subtract that, that you get $40. So $40 added cost. And we get that by taking $139.99 minus uh, $99.99. And the four additional phones we get from taking 6 minus 2. And we would calculate the slope by that for that by figuring out we want to know how much it costs what's the additional cost per phone 
So we would take the $40 and we would divide it by the four phones. Cost on top, phones on the bottom, because our ultimate goal is to have cost per one phone. So 40 divided by 4 would give us 10. So $10 per phone. So do we have enough information to predict the price if the Smith family de decides to get five phones? Well, absolutely. Um, if we know it's $10 a phone, in fact, let's just complete this table because this is something we're going to do in other lessons. So we might as well give it a shot here. So here's our number of phones. And here is our cost. And let's just fill in what we know. Well, we know that I'm going to leave this alone because I don't know that. I don't know how much zero phones would cost. don't know how much one phone would cost. But I know that two phones costs, um, I'm going to go ahead and make our life a little simpler. We'll just round these up to up a penny here. So two phones is roughly $100. Uh, three phones is roughly $110. And we'll leave this blank for four and five. And we'll add, ran out of room here, but we'll add six on the end here. Six phones was 140 So how do we fill in for four and five? Well, we have to add $10. So four phones would be 120 and five phones would be 130. And you could either get that by adding 10 on two times from the three, or you could go back $10 from the six. So as we go this way, it should increase $10 each time. As we go this way, it should decrease $10 each time. So one phone would cost us $90. And for this plan, which again is a little outdated, but if we go back 10, for no phones, it would cost us $80. In other words, there is like a starting amount to this phone plan that we pay, and then we add the phones on. So we pay $80 to get this plan, and then we pay $10 for the phones that we have. They may say it, if they were to advertise it, they may say $90 to start and $10 for each additional phone, because it doesn't really make sense not to have any phones. But technically, the way that, that this works out mathematically is it's an $80 cost up front and then $10 for every phone that you have. So it says, um, write a summary of your conclusions. So our conclusion is that we would pay $80 um, plus $10 per, per phone. So we're going to continue talking about the cell phone um, situation. And so I've put this table back up that we created in the last lesson. So we had been given two and three phones and the cost for that, and then six. And we filled in the table with the, the other data values uh, kind of in between that. So and went all the way down to zero. So we said zero phones would cost $80, which doesn't make a lot of sense with the phone plan not to have any phones. but it gets us this initial cost. So with no phones, it costs $80. Then we add on one phone, so we can actually use the plan, and it costs us $90. So this would actually be the cheapest cost. But $80 of that $90 is like an initial fee, and then $10 is for the phone. Then $10 for another phone, then $10 for another phone, and so on. So it says in Part C, we use the first two data points to determine the slope. Given that cost per phone, what is the total phone cost for three phones? So this is worded a little um, weird, uh, and I'm not exactly sure which of these they're, to they're talking about. But I think what they're talking about here for the total phone cost, I think they mean just the, uh, the cost of the phones. So the total phone cost is actually $30 on this. So how is the answer to question one related to the second data point? Well, in this one, out of that $110, 30 of it is for phones. So we have a $30. So for three phones, our total cost would be $30 for the phones 
and $80 for the plan. So you're paying $30 for those three phones, but $80 for the plan. So it says to uh, draw a line that would include all the points of the plane. Hold on, I think I'm missing part of the directions here. Yes. So draw a line that would include all the points. Extend the line to the edges of the plane. So we've got um, 0 is 80, 1 is 90, and again we have to look at the scale here. This is not going by tens now. Because if this is going by tens, this would be 90 and this would be 100. But this is 100. So we're going by fives. 85, 90, 95, 100. And you have to figure that out before you start marking on here, or you're going to get things in the wrong place. So we said that um, one phone was $90, two phones was $100, three phones was 110, four phones was 120, five phones was 130, and six phones right here was 140. So we've gone all the way from one edge to the other edge, and we've gotten all these points in here. We wouldn't need all these points. We honestly would just need um, a couple of those points, and if you had a straight edge, you could connect them. Uh, again, I can't do a straight edge on here, but um, you can do it with uh, when you do it by hand. Um, actually, let me try something really quick and see if I can get a better point through that by maybe using the, the line tool. So yes, I used the line tool here in paint, and I got a, ni a lot nicer line. So you can get a nice straight line if you use a straight edge or a tool on the computer. Okay, so now let's go back to our, our questions here. It says, um, use the line to estimate the cost of having a plan with only one phone. Well, we can use the table, because if we were filling in the table with just their data, we would have only had points for 2, 3, and 6. And then if you come through here, 1 is at about 90. So you can either look at the table at one phone is 90, I'm sorry, the, the, the graph, and see that one phone is 90, or we could use the table. How does that relate to question 2? Well, here we're saying that for one phone, you're paying $10 for the phones plus $80 for the plan. And that was for a total of $90. So write a sentence that includes all the information you need to know about the cost. So it's an $80 upfront fee or service fee or whatever they might cost, call it plus it's $10 per phone. And now we're supposed to change that into um, an equation. So cost equals, and I'm going to put it down here. I'm not going to use their their thing. We're just going to do it all in. So cost equals $80 plus $10 per phone. And I like to use C for cost rather than using like a Y because it helps me remember what it was. And P for phone, even though you could use an X, is kind of up to you. So recall from the preview questions that points on the coordinate plane are often called X and Y and that the vertical axis is often called the Y axis. The point where a graph touches or crosses that Y axis is often called the Y intercept. So label the Y intercept, the Y axis and the Y intercept on our graph. And does this make sense? So if we go back over here, we're talking about the y-axis and where the graph touches it. So we're saying that this point right here is the y-intercept. So the this is the y-axis. The cost is the y-axis. And this point right here is the um, $80 is the 
uh, y intercept. So for eight, it says the Smiths are talking about or thinking about adding some premium channels. Oh, well, let's go back to this really quick before we finalize this. I forgot that that was the last question. So when we look at this equation, this $80 that we have here is the y-intercept and $10 is the slope. So let's write that a little bit more distinctly. So $80 is the y-intercept. and 10 is the slope. 80 is where it starts, whether you look at the graph or you look at the equation, it's where it starts, and then 10 is how much it goes up per phone. $10 per phone, up here it goes up 10 for every phone, up 10 at a, for another phone, up 10 for another phone, and so on. So now it says that the Smiths are thinking about um, adding some premium channels to their cable package. They surveyed some friends and discovered the information shown in the table and we're going to inspect the table to determine the relationship between the cost of cable and the number of premium channels. And again I'm going to cheat just a little bit here. I don't like that they use these weird numbers. Um, you might run into this in your homework but on an exam or something I'm not going to give you these odd, these uh, unusual numbers. So I'm just going to round that. That was 54.98. We're just going to say 55. And this is 99.95. We're just going to say that's basically uh, 100. It's not exactly, but it's close. If you do this exactly, your slope will come out just a little bit different than what we're going to get, but pretty close. And then for five premium channels, it's going to be, we'll call it 115 instead of 114.94. make our life just a little easier with these numbers. So what is the cost per premium channel? And what does that tell us about the y-intercept? Well, we can look at the first two here, um, but they're three channels apart from each other, so that's a little hard. But if we look here from four to five, that's only an, one additional channel. So when we added one additional channel, what happened? We added $15. So it appears that each additional channel is $15. Let's double check it with this one that's a little bit harder. So when we added three, if they're $15 a piece, we should add $45. Is that the case? And yes, it is. So one additional channel is 15. Three additional channels was 45. So we are finding that the cost per premium channel is $15. What does this tell you about the y-intercept? Well, right now we don't know what the y-intercept is, but I'm going to do the same method that I used up here, and I highly recommend you do this on the exams and your homework. Take this table that they gave us and fill it in with all the values. It's much easier than the way that they talk about in the book. So we have the number of channels and we have the cost. And if we just make this table start at zero, and go up, it makes it so much easier to understand this problem. So this is going to be 0. We don't have that yet. This is going to be 1, 2. 1 we have. 1 is $55. 2 we don't have. 3 we don't have. We know 4 is $100. And then we know that 5 is $115. So we're going to have everything filled in um, that we need all the way from up to the biggest one that they have here, which is 5. So we know that this goes up 15 each time. So if I add 15, this is going to be $70.
If I add 15, this is going to be $85. If I add 15, that gets me to 100. If I add another 15, that gets me to 115. And you can see if your pattern works and if it falls on the right numbers. So now, if I want to go this way, I have to take off $15. So taking off $15 gives me to $40. So what does this tell you about the y-intercept? It is $40. The y-intercept is always with the zero. Again, I would highly recommend this method of filling in your table all the way from zero up. Fill in what you know and then use the, the slope that you calculate to figure out what the missing pieces are. So uh, write a sentence in contact, context which includes the slope and the y-intercept of this relationship. Does it make sense? So we're going to write a sentence and write an equation. So uh, the starting fee or the basic cable, let's write that that way because that's how they always word it on here. So basic cable without any premium channels is $40 um, and added channels, added premium channels are $15 each. If we wanted to write that in, in an equation, the cost of this is $40 plus uh, $15 for each additional premium channel. So P for premium. So cost is 40 plus $15 for each premium channel. 40 being the initial cost for just a basic cable and then the 15 is the, is the slope. So this is the y-intercept or the starting value and this is the slope. Ah, try it again. So next it says predict the cost of cable service if the Smiths order six premium channels. Well, another reason that this table is great is now I can go ahead and, and add onto this table and get the answer to this. So if I just go up one more column six channels should cost $130. I could also go here and put in six premium channels into this equation. So let's try that. So we've got C equals 40 plus 15. And then instead of P, we're going to put in our six channels. So 15 times six and if I calculate that, that's 40 plus 90, which is 130. So it fits in the table, it fits with our equation. So six premium channels should cost the Smiths $130. And we're going to conclude lesson 16 by talking about um, one more uh, scenario with uh, Sparks Electrical Service and they want us to write a sentence that represents the relationship between cost and hours for Sparks Electrical Services. Sparks Electric Services. So if we look down here, um, one thing that makes this a tiny bit harder than the other ones that we've had is there's no uh, rows that are only one apart. We have three apart, six apart, five apart, but we don't have any that are just consecutive. So we're going to have to use, we can use any one we want, but I'm going to use uh, here to here because it's the easiest. So this is um, an additional three hours and it costs an additional, I just subtracted those two values, an additional $174. So it appears if we divide that, 174 divided by 3 is, it looks that each hour is $58. Now I'm going to 
um, do things just a little differently than they encourage us to do in the book because again I think this is easier. Now I'm not going to go all the way to 16 because um, that's going to be a large table but I'm going to go back and at least start on this table so that we can go back to 0. And so I'm going to go up to 5. So if you have your hours and your cost, we know we don't know 0 and we don't know 1. But we do know that 2 is $161. We don't know 3. We don't know 4. But we do know that 5 is 335. Maybe I'll fill in 6 and 7 since I have space here. So what we want to do, we know that Again, $174 for three additional hours means an hour is $58. So $58 per hour is their rate. But that's not all that they charge because if that was the case, then two hours should only cost $116. And it doesn't. It costs $161. So let's go back and calculate what zero hours would be. So if I take 161 minus 58, that gets me 103. And then if I take and subtract 58 again, I get 45. So they aren't uh, charging strictly by the hour, they're charging an initial fee. A lot of times with um, services like this, that's called a trip fee. So they charge $45 to come to your house and, and see what's wrong, and then they say, okay, now that you've paid us the $45, it's $58 additional um, for each additional hour. But whether or not you have them do anything after that, they still charge you that $45 trip fee. Otherwise, they could be running around to people's houses all day long just giving estimates and not ever um, making any money. So they have to charge some amount for their initial time to come to your house and that's usually called a trip fee or an initial fee. So in this case it's $45. Now if we want to fill in these other cells again with just $58. So 161 plus 58 is 219. 219 plus 58 is 277. Double check that we're doing everything okay. If we add 58, we should get to uh, the two or the uh, three. Hold on, I made a mistake somewhere here. So 161 plus 58 is 219, plus another 58 gets us 277 plus another 58 gets us 335, so we're doing good here, and then another 58 is 393, and seven hours of work with the trip fee added in would be 451. Okay, so we've just extended and filled in that table a little bit. Um, so use the first two points to determine the slope of Sparks relationship. Uh, we have that between costs and hours. Um, we know that it's $58 per hour after the initial trip fee. Use the first point to work with and substitute those values in your slope into the mathematical sentence and be sure to substitute numbers back in. Okay, so anyway, we're going to say that the cost is, um, again, cost. you start with that initial amount, so that's right here. So the cost is $45 plus $58 per hour. We've already solved the simplified equation. We're doing this a little different than what they say we have to. And we've rewritten it. We've got everything we need. By making this table, we've got everything I need. we need. So Sparks has a big job coming up that it's estimated to take 32 hours to complete. Use your equation. 
So now I don't want to make that table all the way out to 32, but I've got an equation now that I can use. So the cost is $45 plus $58 times every hour. And the number of hours in this case is going to be a big job. For, you know, that's like a four-day job for one person, or it could be a one-day job if they brought feet four people, but it's going to take 32 man hours to complete that. So if we take 45 plus 58 times 32, we get that that job would cost $1,901. Again, that's a, nearly an entire week of someone's work, and that would cost uh, $1,900. So now we're supposed to graph a line using the points from the table. And I could put as many points in there as I want, but I don't need to put all the points on the table. I can put a few points and then make a line through them, and it should hit the other points. So I'm going to go ahead and do the ones that are here. So 2 would be 161. In this case, it looks like they're going by 50s here. 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300. So 2... 161, this would be 2, 150, and then this would be a little bit above, but not at, not halfway to 200. Um, 5, this is 4, 6, 8, so 5 would be here, and 335 would be not to 350, so right about there. Um, 11 would be 683 which would be right about here. And 16 is 973, so it's almost to 1,000. And I don't know why they put these on here, because we run out of the table at the top before we get there. So let's connect that with a line and I'm going to start here. And it should hit the other points. And there's your line. And I'm going to try to do that. We know that the initial value is, again, $45. So let me take that line now from 45, which would be just below 50, and connect it to there. Yeah, it's a little off, but it's close. So um, that would be our line for the uh, for Sparks costs that they use. So what advantages does the graph of the line have over the equation or table? Well, the nice thing about the graph is it's got we could estimate anything from zero to sixteen on there. Um, the table gets kind of old after about you know, six or seven points, you're like, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. But the table, we could estimate some other values. So we could say, oh, 14 looks like it's around um, $850. Eight looks like it's a little over $500. And you could estimate some things off of this line rather quickly. Um, but the equation has the advantage of and also the table, but the table gets, again, you have to fill it all in, which gets a little tiresome, but the equation is exact. So um, the advantages for the tape or for the graph are that it's very visual, so you can see it, and you can make quick estimates for lots of different points. And the advantage of the equation is that it's exact. So if I wanted to figure out how much, and also um, the equation doesn't run out. You'll notice our graph ran out of space, but our equation we can put in anything we want. So it doesn't, quote, run out. So if we wanted to figure out, say, 14 or 32 or anything, we could, um, we could do that using this table. So if we wanted to figure out the cost for 
say, 10 hours, we could do that. So the cost equals $45 plus $58 times 10. And that would get us the cost. And we can do that for anything. So 50, uh, 45 plus 58 times 10. which of course is 45 plus 580, comes out to be $625. I don't know what kind of crazy equal sign I made there. Try to make that a little bit nicer. So $625. So whatever, whatever we wanted to calculate, we could do. And when we're looking at this, if you're asked, um, this first number here is going to be your y-intercept. That's where it crosses the y-axis. That's the same as your initial value. So your y-intercept is your initial value. And the other number that you put in front of whatever unit is changing, that's going to be your slope. So it's the increase per unit, whatever your unit is. So in this case, it's, it's an hour. Before it was a gallon. Uh, so every additional hour gets you um, an additional cost of $58.